So this week, we're going to go ahead and continue our chapter by chapter and verse by verse study of the book of Hebrews. And the last time we were together, we left off in Hebrews chapter 4, chapter uh, verse 13, and so we'll be picking up in verse 14 of chapter 4. And I've titled today's message, A Greater High Priest. Now, before we pick up where we left off in chapter 4, there's a few things I want to remind you of that I think will help you to understand the rest of this chapter that we're going to be covering a little bit better. Now, so far, the author has mentioned the fact that Moses didn't lead the people of Israel into the promised land and how even he himself was forbidden to enter the land. He then mentioned how Joshua, in, in chapter 4, verse 8, how Joshua led them, the people of Israel, into the physical rest, but not into the promised spiritual rest. And so now the question is, but what about Aaron, the first high priest? Is it possible that the Aaronic um, priesthood, with all of its sacrifices and ceremonies, could bring a troubled soul into rest? See, the Hebrew Christians who received this letter were sorely tempted to return to the religion of their fathers. After all, any Jew could travel to Jerusalem and see the temple and the priest ministering at the altar. And so for them, the temple, the altar, the sacrifices were real. They were tangible. They were visible. They were concrete. And so many times... It's the same with believers today. When, it's, when a person is going through persecution, as these Hebrew Christians were, it's, a, it's much easier to walk by, say, by sight than by faith. And if we're completely honest, a lot of us have probably doubted the Lord under much less prov provocation than these people were enduring. And so as I've mentioned several times already throughout this, throughout uh, the chapters that we've already covered, the central theme of Hebrews is the priesthood of Jesus Christ and what he's doing now in heaven on behalf of his people. So these passages that we'll be looking at today will answer the question, is the high priestly ministry of Christ superior to that of Aaron and his successors? And what we'll discover is that, yes, it is. And the writer will prove this by presenting four arguments. And so before we get into the first one, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning through his word. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful you brought us all here together, Lord. We pray for those that, uh, that aren't here, Lord, that weren't able to make it because of vacation, because of things going on, Lord, maybe because they're ill, they're not feeling well, Lord. I, we pray for them, that you will heal them, that you will watch over them and protect them, and, and that you will give them the comfort they need. For those that are out and about, Lord, their families, we pray they, they have a blessed time. We pray that you will also watch over them, keep them safe, Lord, from any harm. Use them to be your light and salt, Lord, and, and may they just spend that time with you, glorifying you for just the wonderful blessings. And so now as we get into your word, I pray that you will speak powerfully, Lord. Speak powerfully to our, our hearts and minds. Implant those seeds deep within those areas so they will cause everlasting change. Pray for those watching and listening that you also change their lives, Lord. 
that you will also, this message will go out there powerfully. Lord, and that people will become born again and believe in your son, Jesus Christ. So again, bless this time, Lord. Fill this room with your spirit. Use me as your instrument to proclaim your truth. And Lord, again, just bless this time. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. In these final three verses of chapter 4, the author draws out his first argument by explaining, among other things, how Jesus Christ has a superior title. As he's done in several occasions already, he uses the words, therefore, since, in verse 14, to link this section to the arguments he made back in chapter 2. Here, though, he specifically begins to develop the priestly ministry of Jesus in detail. Now, Aaron, Moses' brother, was the high priest. But Jesus Christ is the great high priest. This is a title that no other Old Testament priest could claim. But in what does our Lord's greatness consist? Well, to begin with, Jesus Christ is both God and man. He is Jesus, the Son of God. The name Jesus means Savior and identifies His humanity and His ministry on earth. And Son of God affirms His deity and the fact that He is God. In his unique person, Jesus, Jesus Christ unites deity and humanity so that he can bring people to God and bring to people all that God has for them. Not only in his person, but also in his position, Jesus Christ is great. See, Aaron and his successors ministered in the tabernacle and the temple and in the temple precincts, once a year entering the Holy of Holies. But Jesus Christ has passed through the heavens when he ascended to the Father. Jesus Christ passed through the atmospheric heavens and the planetary heavens into the third heaven, where Paul states in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, that God dwells. Now his Jewish readers would have realized how much better it was to have a high priest who ministers in a heavenly tabernacle than an earthly one. But there's another aspect to Christ's position. Not only is he in heaven, but he's enthroned there. His throne is the throne of grace, mentioned in verse 16. You see, the mercy seat in the Ark of the Covenant was God's throne in Israel. But it can never be called a throne of grace. Why is that? Because grace doesn't veil, veil itself from people and it doesn't hide itself in a tent. Furthermore, the common people weren't permitted to enter the holiest part of the tabernacle, tabernacle and the temple. And the priests got only as far as the veil. 
only the high priest was allowed beyond the veil. He had to do it alone and only once a year on the Day of Atonement. But now, every believer in Christ is invited and is encouraged to approach the throne of grace with boldness. So you see, it truly is a great throne because we have a great high priest who isn't just enthroned there, but is also ministering there. And something else makes him great. He's ministering mercy and grace to those who come for help. See, mercy means that God doesn't give us what we deserve. Grace means that he gives us what we don't deserve. No Old Testament high priest could minister mercy and grace in quite the same way. You see, when an Israelite was tempted, he couldn't just run to the high priest for help. And he certainly couldn't enter the Holy of Holies for God's help. No, he couldn't do that. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you can run to your high priest at any time, in any circumstance, and find the help that you need. Now, because of the superiority of Jesus Christ, the great high priest over Aaron, two important conclusions can be drawn. First, there's no need in giving up our confession just because we're going through testing and trial. Again, these Hebrew Christians were tempted to give up their confession of faith in Christ and their confidence in him. It wasn't a matter of giving up their salvation. Since salvation in Christ is eternal, it's a matter of their public confession of faith. By returning to the Old Testament system of ways, they could be telling everyone that they didn't have any real faith in Christ. This kind of unbelief would only bring a reproach to Christ's name. After all, the great purpose of salvation is the glory of God. It was this glory that Moses was concerned about the most when Israel broke God's law and made a golden calf in Exodus chapter 32. And there, God offered to destroy the nation and begin a new one from Moses. But Moses refused the offer. Instead, he interceded for Israel on the basis of God's glory and God's promise and God spared the people. And the second c conclusion is this. There's no need to go back because we can come boldly into the presence of God and get the help that we need. See, there isn't a trial too great, no temptation too strong that Jesus Christ will refuse he will give us the mercy and grace that we need when we need it. But he's too far away, we may argue. And he's the perfect son of God. What can he know about problems of weak sinners like us? But that's part of his greatness, my friends. When he was ministering on earth, in human body, he experienced all that we experience, and even more. See, after all, a sinless person would feel temptations and trials in a much greater way than you and I could ever feel them. Christ was tempted, yet he did not sin. And he's able to help us when we're tempted. 
So if we fail to hold fast our confession, we're not proving that Jesus Christ has failed. We're only telling the world that we fail to draw on his grace and mercy when it was freely available to us. Friends, verses 14 through 16 tells us that as Christians, we have a great high priest, one that has passed through the heavens, atones for sins, and intercedes for us before the Father. Jesus, our intercessor, identifies with us because he has experienced in every respect the same temptations that we experience. Therefore, we can come before the throne of God every day as well as on the last day with confidence because we know Christ mediates for us before the Father. If Christ wasn't our great high priest, we wouldn't be able to stand before God. We'd be cast from his presence for all of eternity. But here's the thing. If you're a Christian, you no longer live under this threat because righteous judgment has been replaced by radical mercy. Therefore, whether you're in the midst of a trial or being tempted to sin, don't shrink from God's presence. Don't say, oh, I can't go to God. I totally blew it this time. I'm, you know, she's not going to... He's going to be mad. He's going to send me into a timeout room. No, don't shrink away from his presence. If you've been struggling with any sin, whether it's gambling, whether it's pornography, whether it's gossip, whether you have a, a tendency to st steal things that aren't yours, take things that aren't yours, you know, get back up. If you've sinned, get back up and keep walking. That's what the Lord wants you to do. Don't shrink from God's presence. You can approach the throne of grace with boldness. And you can ask him to forgive you, and he will. Because he loves you. Those, you know, those marks on his hand and on his feet, on his head and on his side, show how much he loves you. And what he went through to show you how much he loves you. So don't shrink back from God's presence. Instead, draw near to him with all boldness and confidence. Knowing that he is willing to equip you with mercy and grace in your times of need. So now, and again, I'm going to summarize, uh, summarize all these things at the end. But his next argument um, is found in the beginning of verse uh, chapter 5. So I'm going to read the first eight verses of chapter 5. And again, actually there we're going to find his second and third arguments. So Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed in matters pertaining to God for the people to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he also, since he, he is also clothed with weakness. Because of this, he must make an offering for his own sins as well as for the people. No one takes this honor on himself. Instead, a person is called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not exalt himself to become a high priest. But God, who said to him, you are my son, today I have become your father. Also, says another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. During his earthly life, he offered prayers and appeals with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because he was his, because of his reverence. Although he was the son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. 
in these verses, the author of Hebrews makes his second and third argument as to why Jesus is superior as high priest. First of all, because he has a superior ordination. Verse 1 identifies the defining mark of Judaism, the role of high priest. In the book of Exodus, we're told that Aaron, brother of Moses, was the first high priest and representative of the people, chosen from among men. But who chose him? Did the people, through some kind of democratic process, choose him? No. Only God appoints high priest. There were, in, there were instances in the Old Testament where people tried to appoint themselves as priests, as a high priests, but it always ended up disastrously. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, King Saul invaded the priesthood and lost his kingdom. In number 16, Korah and his fellow rebels tried to make themselves priests, and God judged them. And in 2, Corinthians, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 26, when King Uzziah tried to enter the temple and burn incense, God afflicted him with leprosy. So see, unless the sacrifices were offered in the right place by the right person, they were not accepted by God. The very existence of a priesthood and a system of sacrifices gave evidence that man was duly ordained and installed in that office. Well, this process was no different with Jesus. God, just as he had done with every other high priest, appointed Jesus singularly. The Father chose and assigned him to this priestly task. Now, the quotation in Hebrews chapter, or chapter 5, verse 5, is from Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. This psalm was already quoted in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, to prove that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But the emphasis here in verse 5 is on the priesthood of Jesus Christ, not his deity. What significance, then, does this quotation have to the argument, have for this argument? The question to the answer to that question is in Acts chapter 13, verse 33 and 34, where the apostle Paul quoted again Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, and explained what it means. The phrase, Today I become your father, doesn't refer to the birth of Christ in Bethlehem, but to his resurrection from the dead. The Son of God was begotten into a glorious new life in his resurrection. He ascended to heaven in a glorified body to become our high priest at the throne of grace. When Aaron was ordained to the priesthood, he offered sacrifices of animals. But Jesus Christ, to become high priest, offered the sacrifice of himself and then arose from the dead. But God the Father not only said, you are my son in Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, he also said, you are priest forever in the order of Melchizedek to affirm Jesus Christ's final victory over all his enemies. See, when Aaron was ordained, God didn't speak directly to him and declare his priesthood. But the father did make this special declaration concerning his son. Two factors make Christ's priesthood unique. Therefore, his ordination is greater. First, he is high priest forever. No Old Testament priest ministered forever because each high priest died and relinquished the office to his successor. The word forever is an important one in this letter. At least six times the writer affirms that Christ's high priesthood is forever. And since he is priest forever, 
He gives his people salvation forever. The second factor that makes Christ's ordination unique is that he belongs to a different order from the Old Testament priests. They belong to the order of Aaron. He belongs, but Jesus belongs to the order of Melchizedek. This is a key concept in Hebrews. So we must take time to examine and understand it. Melchizedek is only mentioned is mentioned in only two places in the entire Old Testament. Genesis chapter 14, verses 17, 17 through 24, and Psalm, chap, uh, Psalm 110, verse 4. His name means king of righteousness, and he was also the king of Salem. And many of you probably know Salem means peace. But the fascinating thing about Melchizedek is that he was both a priest and a king. King Uzziah wanted to be both priest and king, and God judged him. Only in Jesus Christ and in pre-law Melchizedek were these two offices combined. Jesus Christ is high priest is a high priest on a throne. The reason Jesus Christ can be priest forever is that he belongs to the order of Melchizedek. As far as the Old Testament record is concerned, Melchizedek, listen carefully, never died. Now, of course, because he was a real man, he did die at, a certain, at some point, but the record is not given to us. And so Melchizedek becomes a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is priest forever. But Melchizedek also pictures our Lord as a heavenly high priest. Jesus Christ could never have served as a priest when he was here on earth, because he didn't belong to the tribe of Levi. Jesus was born of the seed of David, the tribe of Judah. He became the sacrifice on earth that he might become the high priest in heaven. Now, all of these things, all of these truths will be expanded more, will be developed more in uh, Hebrews chapter 7 um, and 10. But they're introduced here. The author here introduces them here. And we'll, when we get there, we'll talk about it a little, a little more. Well, after mentioning this, he states his third argument as to why Jesus is a superior priest in verses 7 and 8. And there Jesus reveals a superior sympathy. Here the author steps away from the theological groundwork he's been laying to turn his attention to the incarnated life of Christ during his earthly life, points the reader to the ministry of Jesus. Even though Jesus was totally without sin, he didn't make him exempt from the frailty of human experience. Even Jesus dealt with the heartache and grief associated with human existence. This is what Jesus' prayers and supplications signaled. He signaled that he was dependent on God to meet his needs and sustain him at all times. Jesus was like, like any other human being in this regard. So with loud cries and tears, the, that phrase there it recalls Jesus' experience in the Garden of Gethsemane. To the one who was able to save him from death, that phrase there reveals that this is definitely speaking of Jesus. But this reference doesn't limit Jesus' loud cries and tears to his experience at Gethsemane. For Jesus faced the anguish of becoming sin for those 
who believed in him and he bore the burdens of human existence in his flesh. Scripture shows us Jesus offering up prayers and supplications way before the cross, long before he went to the cross. One example of this is in the high priestly prayer of John chapter 17. Loud cries and tears were regularly were regular features in Jesus' prayer life. Christ's prayers to the one who was able to save him from death weren't prayers expressing his desire to escape the cross and the grave. He predicted his own death many times throughout the gospel and said that death was the purpose for which he was sent to the world. Jesus didn't pray in order to be saved from dying. He prayed in order to be saved out of death through the resurrection. Jesus' prayer to be saved from death was a prayer to be raised from the grave. The one who was able to save Jesus from death answered his prayer when he did just that. When he delivered him from death in his resurrection. Well, the father wasn't deaf to the loud cries and tears of his son. He heard and answered his son's prayers, his son's prayers because of his reverence. Now, a good way to think of this reverence, reverence is in terms of awe, devotion, or submission. The father heard the son because Jesus feared God and because he was totally submitted, because he totally submitted to his will, to his will, to his father's. In verse 8, the author explains that Jesus learned obedience to God through what he suffered, even though he was God's son. That Jesus learned obedience should not cause us to think that Jesus needed to be taught obedience because he was disobedient at one point. Hebrews is clear that Jesus never disobeyed. Rather, this verse highlights his humanity. As Jesus experienced the trials associated with human existence, he learned how to obey his Father in them. Suffering taught Jesus how to submit his will to the Father's will. We see this lesson at its sharpest point at Gethsemane and on Calvary. The cross meant ter <clears throat> excuse me, terrible agony of heart and body for Christ. But he remained resolute in his willingness to be obedient. He never wavered, even obedient to the point of death. By faithfully enduring the suffering ordained by the Father's plan to redeem sinners through his own blood, Jesus learned obedience. No one else ever died this kind of death that Jesus died. Scripture says that he was made sin for us. You see, men have died because of their own sins, but only Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. He experienced the ultimate in suffering and therefore, he is able to sympathize with his people when they are suffering. Brother and sister in Christ, no matter what trials you meet, Jesus is able to understand your needs and help you. You need never doubt his ability to sympathize and strengthen it's also worth noting that sometimes God puts us through difficulties that we might that we might better understand the needs of others. When C. H. Spurgeon was a young preacher in London, his successful ministry aroused the envy of some of the clergy, 
and they attacked him with various kinds of slander and gossip. His sermons were called trashy, and he was called an actor and a pulpit buffoon. But even after his ministry was established, Spurgeon was lied about in the press, including the religious press. And this was bound to discourage him. After one particularly scurrilous report in the press, Spurgeon fell before the Lord and prayed, O Lord Jesus, thou didst make thyself of no reputation for me. I willingly lay my reputation down for thy sake. And from that time on, Spurgeon had peace in his heart. He knew that his great high priest understood his need and would give him the grace that he needed each hour. So now we reach the fourth and final argument in these first, in, in the passages that we are covering. So let's pick up in verse 9. We're just reading verse 9 and 10. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. After he was perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And he was declared by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The fourth and final argument the author makes about why Jesus is a superior high priest is that he offered a superior sacrifice. Now, the topic, this topic has already been touched on, and the writer of Hebrews discusses it in detail in Hebrews chapter 9 and 10. But two important matters are involved here. The first is that Jesus Christ didn't need to offer sacrifices for himself. You see, in the annual Day of Atonement, the high priest had to first, had, uh, first had to sacrifice for himself. And then he could offer the sacrifices for his nation. And so, since Jesus was sin, the sinless Son of God, there was no need for him to sacrifice for himself. He was in perfect fellowship with the Father and needed no cleansing. The second matter is that our Lord's sacrifice was once and for all, whereas the Old Testament sacrifices had to be repeated year after year after year after year. Furthermore, those sacrifices could only cover sin. They can never cleanse sins. It required the sacrifice of a spotless lamb of God for sin to be cleansed and removed. And because he is a sinless, eternal son of God, and because he offered a perfect sacrifice, Jesus Christ is the author of eternal salvation. No Old Testament priest could offer this eternal salvation to anyone. But that's exactly what we have now in Jesus Christ. Now, there's a couple of phrases in verse 9 that I need to make sure that I clarify, that I need to touch on, because they've often led to some confusion. First of all, the word perfected in verse 9 doesn't suggest that Jesus was ever, ever at any point of his life imperfect. The word actually means made complete, which I touched upon when we covered Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. And so you see, in other words, by means of his eternal suffering, of his earthly sufferings, our Lord Jesus was equipped for his heavenly ministry as our high priest and is now able to save, keep, and strengthen his people. Secondly, the phrase, all that obey him, doesn't imply that if we don't obey him, we may lose that eternal salvation. See, to obey him 
is the same as to trust God and describe those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. If you look at Acts chapter 6, verse 7, a large, it says that a large group of priests became ob obedient to the faith. But later in Romans chapter 10, verse 16, Paul clarified this by saying, but not all obeyed the gospel. Peter 2 also mentions this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. You have purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth. And so the point being is that once you've had, once you've put your faith in Jesus Christ and thus obeying his call, you experience eternal salvation. Now, although there are no commands or direct applications in the text that we read, there are many applications just beneath the surface. And I just want to share a few here. If our sin is so hideous that God required nothing less than the death of his perfect, sinless son as the only solution, then we would be foolish. We would be so dumb to think that any human solution will suffice. Any system of salvation by good works trashes Christ's death as unnecessary. Number two, if God's wrath against sin is, is so dreadful, then we need to flee to the cross for refuge and daily live with gratitude that Jesus bore our penalty on the cross. A.W. Pink wrote, Into what infinite depths of humiliation did the Son of God descend? How unspeakably, unspeakably dreadful was his anguish. What a hideous thing sin must, have, must be if such sacrifice was required for its atonement. How real and terrible a thing is the wrath of God. What love, move, what love moved him to suffer so in our behalf? What must be the portion of those who despise and reject such a Savior? Powerful words, and it's true. Number three, you, number three obedient faith is the only kind of faith that saves. Now, this isn't to contradict the first point, but to clarify and complement it. We're saved by faith alone, apart from works. But the kind of faith that saves necessarily issues in good works. The one who says that he has faith but has no works is deceiving himself according to what it says in James chapter 2. We should therefore, all of us, be devoted to God and his will. No matter what the cost, just as Jesus was. Number four, prayer and obedient faith are inextricable, inextricable, sorry, I had the word before, inextricably linked. They're linked, they're meshed, they're together, they, they go hand in hand. I should have used that word instead. Jesus prayed in the garden so that he could obey on the cross. So if you wish to follow him in his obedience to the Father, you must follow Jesus in his prayer life. Number five, God's love for us doesn't preclude his taking us through great trials. Commenting on the death of Lazarus, one pastor said, never interpret God's love by your circumstances, but always interpret your circumstances by his love. Beautiful words. Number six, feeling deep emotions during trials 
It isn't wrong. But we must submit our emotions to the will of God. The often repeated comment, emotions aren't right or wrong. Emotions just are, has a grain of truth in it, but a lot of error. The truth is, don't deny the emotions that you're experiencing. The error is, your emotions may be acceptable in God's sight, or they may be sinful. Grief in a time of loss is acceptable. Railing at God or being bitter towards Him is sinful. Though God strip us of everything as He did with Job, Job, we should, through our tears, say with Job, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And finally, number seven, even as God answered Christ's prayers for deliverance through death and resurrection, so he sometimes answers our prayers in ways that seem contradictory to our request. Some say that we're not praying in faith if we pray, Lord, your will be done. They say that we must be bold and ask for God, ask God what we want and claim it by faith. It seems, though, that Jesus didn't understand this principle. He prayed in Luke chapter 22, verse 20, verse 42. Listen carefully. He said this, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. God answered Jesus' prayer by sustaining him through the cross and into the resurrection and ascension. He may not answer your request exactly as you pray, but let me share with you another piece of truth found in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, that often happens and there it says we do not know what to pray for as we should but the spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings and so in closing church it's difficult to resist the four arguments presented in this section and so we must conclude with the writer that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the great high priest. The great high priest is indeed superior to Aaron. It would be foolish for anyone to return to the inferiorities of the old law when he could just enjoy the superiorities of Jesus Christ. But the question still remains. Why are these Hebrew believers tempted to go back into legalism? Because they were not going on to maturity in Christ. And this is the reason the writer paused to exhort them to grow up in the Lord. And that, my friends, will be what the theme is in chapter 6. And that's what we'll be covering next week or maybe the week after that. We still have to finish chapter 5. But here's what I want to close with. All of you, whether you're here, watching, listening, all of you need a high priest because God is infinitely holy and you're a sinner. Jesus Christ is that high priest. If you haven't done so already, run to him, flee to him for salvation, and live daily at the foot of the cross. Even if you are a believer, even if you've been walking with the Lord for 5, 10, 
for one month, a year, five years, 20 years, 50 years, whatever it may be, run to the cross. Flee to him and just be there at the foot of the cross. He will be there to help you and sustain you during those difficult times, during those hard times that you feel like you just can't make it. And he will give you what you need at that moment. Trust in that. Believe in that. Think of all the times he sustained you and he was with you all during those difficult times as a believer. And think about, and then compare that with how it was when you weren't and how you dealt with setbacks, how you dealt with disappointment, with trials, when things, when the world seemed like they were, it was crashing in around you. When you're a believer, when the Holy Spirit is living in you, there's peace and comfort in knowing that Jesus is with you the entire way. So come to him daily, hourly. Never stop. Keep your eyes on him. For those of you who have never sought him, those of you who have tried looking for that peace and comfort in other places. I want to invite you to come to the cross and make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior today. Don't wait until tomorrow. Don't wait until next week. Do it now. He wants to be your King. He wants to be your Lord. And he wants to give you everlasting life. All you have to do is accept it. Receive that forgiveness. So if you're ready to confess your sins. Become born again. I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. And pray this with all your heart. With all sincerity. He's... He hears you. He's, he knows your heart. You can't lie to him. And if you are sincerely ready to receive him, to believe in him, to trust in him, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask you right now to forgive me. I do truly believe that you died for my sins and rose from the grave. And so now I repent of my sins. I turn away from them and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. And thank you for forgiving me. And thank you for saving me. So now, Lord, I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and teach me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you've prayed that, please reach out to us. We want to hear, want to hear your story. We want to pray with you. We want to lead you in your next steps of this new Christian life. Wherever you may be, you know, there's a place for you. The Lord has a place for you. And we want to help you find that place. Whether it's on the other side of the world, whether it's here locally, you can always come here. You know, we've been at it now, what, it's going to be six years, and, and that's what we do here. We just teach the, the Word of God. No fancy, nothing fancy, no light shows, no smoke uh, machines, no motivational speeches. Just teach, we just teach the Word of God, and 
I guarantee you that here you will learn it and you just will love it. You'll fall in love with it. So reach out to us again. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this message. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Um, We look forward to seeing you again next week and as we continue on in chapter 5 and I think possibly we'll also be beginning chapter 6 a little bit. We'll see. Um, But again, it's all in the hands of the Lord. We'll see. But thank you. Have a great week. Be blessed. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.